Maybe we should talk about intoxicants. Okay. Yeah. So, what about intoxicants? You know, like when I was studying Buddhism, I saw that that was one of the prescriptions was mm -hmm. intoxicants. Uh, Christianity is divided on it because you know it's both the Eucharist but also the source of temperance movements and mm -hmm. so forth. Uh, what's your perspective on intoxicants and uh, the path of non-duality? Hmm. Well, I, I spent a, a lot of time in alcohol. Mm. I wasn't a hardcore alcoholic. Mm -hmm. I, was a, I almost never drank alone, but I, I drank a lot. Mm. I partied a lot. Uh, I don't know why I did that. My family has some history of it. But um, I didn't know that it impeded me. Well, I, I will say now I don't basically do any, just because it carries over into the course of the next day. And it does make you less sharp. And so I just don't do it. But it wasn't because there's any prohibition against it. I just experienced it enough that, in fact, I found it wasn't doesn't work for me, really, mm -hmm. ultimately. And so, in that perspective, it just you know I just let go of it. Like, it happened with sex. I mean, mm -hmm. Sex I was, was one way. And as I experienced a lot of that, then I just found myself moving on to other things. I mean, the awakening process, you know, we've talked about many times, this process is so different from and above and beyond what most normal intoxicating situations are, or even sexual situations are for me, that in fact you aren't drawn to. It. No need for prohibition. There's no reason you can't drink alcohol, which you can, or wines, you can drink beer, or give me a hard liquor, whatever it is. There's not any meaning behind that statement. You don't need a proscription against them because you will eventually, hopefully, discover that in fact they are not productive. Useful. See, I think this is a really quick way of getting to the idea that you know, the path of non-duality is such a powerful transformer of selves that the idea of a code of ethics appears as a kind of non sequitur. It doesn't, there's no need for a code of ethics. There's no need for what we think of as, you know, moral prescriptions. Mm -hmm. Because that which would be the spur towards these kinds of transgressions, whether it be intoxicants or in the moral realm, is actually this occasion, this yearning that is pointing towards non-duality. So, mm -hmm. so in that sense, you know, for example, when somebody who's watching the video maybe say, at the end of the day, they feel stressed out and they find themselves going to have a cocktail or mm -hmm. a beer. It actually provides an occasion not to say, oh, look at you going and having a cocktail, saying, what is it that is pulling me to have a cocktail. What, what is the feeling that makes me want to have alcohol? And really, and, and again, not to, not to label it or even judge it, but just to get to know that feeling, to discern that feeling. Because when we discern that feeling, that feeling is actually trying to teach us something. And rather than allowing that feeling to teach us something, most of the times we just want that feeling to go away. Go away because we don't know what to do with it. That's right. So then we use alcohol or cannabis or some other intoxicant to sort of have another feeling to focus on. I think, that I, sense? I think that's a key point is, yeah. is we don't know there's an alternative. Yeah. I mean, to me, that, that was how I had fun. Yeah. I mean, I loved to party. Yeah. And I had alcohol to have fun. Yeah. And I was papering over the fact that I wasn't fun inside. Yeah. And so this was a way to escape for a while yeah. and get rid of that pain and suffering and paper it over for three or four or five hours and pay for it the next day. But then, you know, that's what you, it's right though. If you begin to get a little more awake, you begin to say, hey, look, what am I running away from? What am yeah. I hiding from? Why do I do this to have fun to fix up my life that isn't fun? And so you begin to say, well, if you get reflective, self-reflective, you begin to wind your way back out of that and say, well, okay, is this working for me? It's not working. I'm doing a lot of it, but it's not working for me. I'm trying to do a lot. So you just find yourself winding your way back out of that then naturally. If, but not everybody does this. I mean, Wayne Lickerman is a well-known teacher right now. And he was in a lot of drugs and a lot of alcohol. And he's now a great teacher. A very good, very good teacher. And you know, it was that point of getting into it and then realizing it wasn't solving the problem. I guess he had some friends who died. But you know, he got into this. You know, somebody wakes up, not everybody, and says, "Hey, look, 
this is not going to solve the problem. If you, can, if you get that wake up call from the universe that says, this isn't going to work, you begin saying, I, would have, I have to find another way out of this thing. This is not happening. It's not working properly. And you can do that. But it takes that turn. I mean, we've talked before about where does that initiative come for that turn, that insight, where you begin to see that this isn't working for me. No matter how much cannabis I have or how much alcohol I have or how much whatever it is that I have, it's not solving the problem. At the end of the day, post, I'm back what I was before. I think part of the answer to that question has to be that there, through luck or pluck, you know, that there's a moment where we can go slowly enough with that feeling that we're trying to mask, mm -hmm. right? That in other words, that instead of immediately getting it away, there's a there's a there's a slowing down that can take place and say, what, yeah. what is that? Like I, I know what it is. I know what it wants me to do. Right. But w what is that? What what's pulling me? Because I can see in retrospect that anything I was ever looking for in alcohol or sex, or drugs, and had plenty of all three, right. uh, was precisely, you know, this perspective of oneness. Mm -hmm. I, w I was looking not to, I thought I was looking to obliterate myself mm -hmm. and, and, and kind of disappear so that I didn't have to feel the self. But, but in, instead what I was, was being kind of, what was being pointed out for me was that there was no self there. Yes. That, that, you know, why is it that you're able to lose self under the experience of intoxicants if there's one there? That's right. <laughs> and you're only happy when you, as you say, you obliterate the self. Yeah. You, you get drunk enough that you obliterate the self. You aren't getting the voices anymore in the head. Yeah. You aren't getting beat, beaten upon. You aren't unhappy. You're out of that for some short sort of time. We talked about, this isn't the same thing, wingsuiting. Mm. You know, wingsuiting, people jump up off these cliffs with these little wingsuits on they go flying out there. And the one big wingsuit in video that you can stream talks about this guy. He said, well, you know, for four seconds after I jump off the cliff, I've got this great expanse of space, this stillness, this, this great expansiveness. It's unlike anything I've ever seen before. And it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. you can, but you can go to all kinds of extremes to try to experience it. Like sex the same way. You get an experience that transcends, pushes you out of yourself, albeit for a short time, mm -hmm. and you come back into yourself again, sometimes even stronger than before. Mm -hmm. But it, it may take an extreme experience to wake you up. And I told you my crawling down the interstate story. I mean, it's one of those ones you say, well, no, this is really going too far. <laughs> this, is, this is really, you're crawling down the interstate now. This is really... This Do you want to say which interstate it was? <laughs> <or>? <laughs> no, no, no. This is not working. <laughs> so something else has to be done. There has to be a better way. <laughs> I'm just pausing on that. Yeah. <laughs> that. That part of the path includes the crawl down the interstate. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I've, I've been in similar, yeah. although not identical, no. situations. And what's, what's interesting about it is, is that, uh, you know, it's the same thing pulling us along. Like, like even the language we use, it's like, oh, I'm going to get wasted. Yes, exactly. You know? It's like, well, you know, I realize that's just perverse language, but what is it that wants to obliterate the self? How about just obliterate the self? Yeah. How about just notice that the self is not there in the way in which you're perceiving it to right. be there? And this is why the old Ramana Maharshi thing, which I, I find myself, you know, having recourse periodically, is like, how about I just die right now? Yeah. Why, 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 why you know, and, and, and by that I mean, to be totally clear, mm -hmm. just let what I think is going to occur, occur. Occur. You know, I don't need to take any physical no. action towards just myself. Lay down just on the floor and pretend to die. Exactly. And die. And you can feel this kind of release. Yeah. That like, oh, and, you, and then you walk around and you're like, oh, look, I'm walking around, I'm like a ghost. I'm, like everything is all still going on, but I'm dead. And I know it sounds like a funny way of yeah. speaking. Right. But you can experiment with that persona, exactly. with that mask. And the eye is dead. Yeah, and, and then and it works perfectly well because the eye is isn't there. It isn't there. It's not there. Well, I mean, we, we talked about with, this gets back to bhakti, and about about surrendering yourself to something higher energy or some other iconic figure. It's the same thing. I mean, the idea is to invite something so completely into your consciousness 
that in fact your eye goes away. Mm -hmm. It gets wasted, it dies, it's obliterated, and maybe it obliterated for some time. And then it may come back again. But you can do that just with you know, with bhakti, with devotional mm -hmm. worship. You can come in and bring it in and look and see there's nothing left inside this that isn't that particular energy. And it doesn't require belief. No, no, it doesn't require belief. Yeah. No, all you say is, can I merge with can I merge with that tree? Exactly what I was thinking about. This black walnut tree black, out the window. Can, can I merge with that can I, can there be no distinction between me and the black walnut tree? Can I so pull that energy into me that I'm not discreet as a subject different from the walnut tree. And if you can do that, then you have totally surrendered. You have given up the eye. The eye has been wasted, it's been obliterated by this absorption into the walnut tree. And the other way around of it is saying, can I find where exactly is the barrier between myself and that black walnut tree? Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, and and you, you search for it, and in searching for it, what you find is the common space between yourself and the tree, mm -hmm. which, as you pointed out to me a while back, starts to become more real than either you or the tree. Yeah, and that's the most, that's the most fascinating. It's like, whoa, you know, the objects used to be the real things. Yeah. Now it's the space is the real thing between me and the ob being object and object. And you say, whoa, that's really weird. I mean, all this stuff that's filled with you know, the space around the objects is what it is. Yeah, the real music's between the notes. The real music is between us, Miles Davis. <laughs>